most useful way that I could get some feedback or maybe some advice um, would be structuring my study schedule around a full-time job that I commute to for a significant portion of the day. Um, I'm trying to find the balance between it. It seems a little bit difficult at times, and I try to use my commute in the best way that I can, but my issue sort of comes that I hit this burnout on the end of the day on the ladder, the commute back to home, and then also my weekend studying, I believe suffers from that because I feel that I do so much during the week. Mm. But whether it be like my actual job or secondarily the LSAT, I just feel kind of tired to a degree. Um, But I'm trying to work through the best way and the best maybe mechanism of scheduling uh, to find the best balance. And I'm not really sure that I found it yet. That's a reasonable concern. So it's natural that at the end of the day, you would be a bit drained and might not be able to get the best studying possible done. What kind of prep are you trying to do during the commute home? Um, So the commute to and from is probably roughly 40 minutes on a train. Um, And then I drive on either side of that afterwards to actually get home. But the 40 minutes on the train, I try to do drilling of exercises currently logic games which are killing me to a certain degree Um, but I try to drill during that time and during my lunch hour I try to study from the actual books and try to see where I'm making mistakes and try to go over that because it is a more significant chunk of time that I do have Um, but I find that at the last the last commute of the day I always just find myself veering off of my focus from logic games and they require all of your focus. And I know that I should be paying more attention to them and you know, not looking out the window and ignoring them or answering text messages, but it comes to a certain point where you, you see the game and you just kind of feel that you don't want to do it at that time. Um, so I'm trying to fight with myself to be a little bit more motivated at the end of the day. Um, that is one of the major struggles. In the morning, I can do it. I can focus. I can do everything that I possibly need to do. But in the evening, it becomes a large task to undertake. Right. So you've got your commute to work. Mm -hmm. You've got lunchtime. You've got the commute home. Mm -hmm. And you've got the weekend. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of time available to you. What if you just didn't try to study on the way home? But then... I feel like that's time in which could be better used, if you know what I mean. Well, let me rephrase it. What if we change the type of studying you try to do on your way home? Instead of solving that, LSAT problems, what else could you mm-hmm. do? I'm not necessarily sure. I always just kind of think that my commute and the strict idea behind it would, is the best time frame that I do have for drilling or doing 35-minute sections or anything like that. Um, and I haven't really considered other options. What do you suggest? Well, so you talked about trying to do logic games, like trying to do actual LSAT problems mm-hmm. on the train home when you're tired. Yeah. So, that, so, I mean, it's reasonable to try to do that. I've certainly mm-hmm. done problems on the train, and it's not always easy when there's distractions and it's not a quiet environment on top of being tired. But what if you could, you could listen to podcasts, you could watch videos, Mm-hmm. You could just read articles about the LSAT and the law school admission process, mm-hmm. and you could save the actual question solving for when you're more fresh Go to ahead. meet yourself where you're at. And so, you know, I have the LSAT Unplugged podcast. I have the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel, and you can pre-download or, or save files so that if your signal isn't strong during the commute, you already have them loaded onto your phone. So you can mm-hmm. still li- listen to them or watch them when you're out of service. Perfect. Perfect. That sounds like a less intensive way to actually be productive. I, I like that idea. Thank you. Sure. Just taking notes, sorry. Of course. Yeah, totally. And then on the weekends, of course, that's your most focused time because you have the whole day before you and you mm-hmm. can make of that whatever you want. You can do full length timed exams. You can do detailed review. You can do several questions by type, whatever is your top priority. Mm-hmm. 
And then my thought was I, so right now I'm kind of at the beginning crawling steps. I'd say maybe I'm a three out of 10 at my journey, let's say. Um, But my question was actually specifically the practice, the practice tests on the weekends. Do you suggest that I take one every weekend or do you suggest that I have like a cap of a certain number? I'm myself aiming towards a, like a June, July LSAT. Um, and I want to be prepared, but the thing is I don't want to be so run through the material too quickly Yeah, and not use it to the best potential that it does have for when I could be using it closer to the exam and actually getting the best benefit out of it. Because looking at a question that you've already kind of gone over loses the surprise factor and the actual measurement of what you would do in that circumstance. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you've got four to five months or more until your actual LSAT test date. So Mm -hmm. I certainly don't think you need to do one exam every single weekend. That would be something like potentially 25 exams or more. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you need to do that. The question is, why are you doing these exams? What are you hoping to get out of them? And have you already built a strong foundation in each section and question type before doing those full-length exams? Gotcha. Um, I would say probably, I don't think that my foundation in logic games is as strong as it should be at this point. I'm having a lot of issues with the in and outs, um, like the question types and just really finding where I should be. I understand the whole idea of diagramming and breaking down the actual rules and then the inferred rules from the actual um, setup. But then morphing them per question is proving a lot more difficult than I anticipated uh, because I have a tendency to think that question one or question two still applies and the rules that it introduced still applies at question eight. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's hard to forget the short term uh, changes and alterations to your base diagram. And I, I, that's what I'm the most having trouble with is separating actually what is set up and what is additional rules and questions. Sure. So I'll speak to this on two levels. One is the specific, one is the general. So the general would be, you could do a timed exam every other week and then use the alternating weekends for working on week areas. That's Mm -hmm. one way you could go about it. Or you could say, I'm not going to do any full length timed exams for a month or two, just focus on basics and then get into the full length timed exams. Mm -hmm. As for these in out grouping logic games, specifically a couple of things you could try. One would be to do several in-out games by type. I have a list in an article on my website called Seven LSAT Logic Games That Repeated. And the first category is these in-out games. So games like The Birds in the Forest, Test 33, Game 2. Games like The Photograph Game, Test 45, Game 3. Test 58, Game 2. And there are many, many others. And so working on those games by type to really see the commonalities in terms of making long conditional chains getting used to not going backwards on those arrows and not inferring too much. And mm-hmm. then with regard to the issue of forgetting in the middle of the game that those restrictions no longer apply, to me, that's just a fundamental LSAT piece of knowledge to get down that the general rules hold true constantly, but local limitations for particular questions no longer apply after that question. So if they say, for example, in question number two, that X is on slot three, you put X on three, you see what results, you have a valid hypothetical scenario as a result of that. But going forward, X does not always have to be on three. Mm -hmm. That's just something to keep in mind with practice. And I think you'll get it with time. You have enough time to to drill that in. And one of my last questions was, the actual digital LSAT is on a, I think it's a Microsoft Surface Go. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge user of tablets. Um, I just never had one growing up and I just kind of morphed into a laptop at a certain point. 
um, which I think a lot of our generation did. Um, I'm interested in the idea of tablets and using it for the study process in order to get myself kind of used to it. Um, but my question would be, do you think that it would be beneficial in which to get something of similar of the similar uh, actual display size that I could, because you know on the LSAC website, they do have the, uh, the setup for the digital LSAT that you could put on any sort of device and see what it would supposedly look like. Um, to get used to that format, to get used to actually using a stylus, to get everything kind of in tune, or do you think that should be pushed to kind of a later date and time within my prep? It's a good question. I think certainly that at some point in the process, you do want to get a tablet and you do want to use practice digital LSATs in that format on the tablet. Mm -hmm. And you can get Microsoft Surface Go, but any tablet is fine. You could get an, you could use an iPad. You could use an Amazon Fire HD 10. 10 inch tablets are the size that you want. And as okay. for whether now versus later, I don't think you need to get one yet. I'd focus on the substance of the exam before focusing on the format or the delivery mechanism. Gotcha. But I wouldn't wait too long. I think that if you want to start doing digital LSATs in that format on a tablet, three months out would not be too early. All righty. And then I find myself discouraged at certain points because I did take a, like a cold pretest um, to see where I sat. And it makes me angry at myself and just kind of, I could have done better and I know I could have done better. Um, but it was something that I didn't know the section substance. I didn't know the, how they would be or what I would even look at formatting wise. Um, but I can't seem to shake that idea that that was my first initial score and I'm not happy with it. Yeah, I get what you mean. That's one reason I don't recommend taking cold diagnostics because the results are always discouraging. So you're certainly not alone in being discouraged by that. The LSAT is a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And so of course the diagnostic is not going to go well because they'll tell you that you simply haven't learned this yet and that there's a lot of work to be done. So just take those results with several grains of salt. Don't place too much stock in them. And if anything, try to use it as motivation later or as a morale booster later, as you can see how far you've come. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, but then also, I think I'm looking at kind of the gauge of where I possibly could be from the very beginning of the cold diagnostic. And I know that it's not recommended to take it on and to really take it into account. But I, I do find myself measuring this is on average what people increase by. This is what I've heard other individuals have increased by, which it might be significant, like a 15 or like a 20 point. But I still find that where I sat for my diagnostic and where I want to be is kind of at the top end of that. And that itself is one of those things in the back of my mind of a lot of people don't make that big of a point difference. Well, there's two different kinds of increases to consider. There's cold diagnostic, no studying at all, to ultimate test day score after tons of studying. Mm -hmm. Those increases are often significant. I personally experienced that myself going from the low 150s to 175. I have many, many stories on my website called LSAT Diaries where students wrote guest posts chronicling their experience. And you could see that I have them all organized by their initial starting score and ultimate test day score. Mm -hmm. The other kind of, of retake score change you have is when someone studied, took an official LSAT, then studies a bit more, takes another official LSAT. And those increases are not likely to be as significant because they already studied before doing the first one. So they're right. not, they're, it's apples and oranges. It's not a proper comparison. Right. Gotcha. And then on the actual admission front, 
I always find myself thinking about timelines and thinking about when things should need to be in or should be in. And my concern is that if I do sit a June or July, probably July LSAT, that would that throw off my timing in order to apply for 2021 application cycle or the entrance of 2021? Well, you're saying taking it in June and July and applying this cycle? Well, applying into the cycle that's coming, yeah. Not, in, not for fall 2020, obviously, but for fall 2021. That's totally fine. I mean, you can apply at the very beginning of the cycle. That's great. But my idea is like, what if I find myself needing to retake? You know what I mean? Then it then in kind of skews my perfect idea of this time to get everything sorted and can apply at the beginning of the cycle. Because I know a lot of places do have a rolling admissions policy, which is kind of dangerous in what I'm thinking because you should be in earlier for a rolling admissions because it is rolling and it does take first priority. Well, even if you take it in the fall, September, October, or November, you can still apply relatively early in the cycle. Applying early matters much less than it used to. So because there's been a recent decline in recent years in the number of applicants overall. And they're waitlisting more and more applicants than ever before. So if you have to retake it in October or even November, that's totally fine. Anything in this calendar year is considered early. January is the latest I'd recommend, but November is still perfectly fine even. Right. And then the other question is, again, on applications, if I don't get what I wanted on my second test. And of course I'm trying to get into these higher schools like the T14. Um, but would it be recommended to take perhaps six months and then try again for another, like a, a summer LSAT in 2021 and then apply for the application cycle of 2022, like take another year? If that's what it takes for you to get the LSAT score that, that you require, that mm -hmm. displays your fullest potential, then yeah, it's absolutely worth it. I mean, folks often don't want to de delay a cycle. So I'm glad to hear that you would consider that possibility because it really is worth it in the long run. Yeah. I just, I just worry that if I delay a cycle and then try for 2022 and I still don't get what I wanted to get, you know what I mean? Like all of like the, the demons in your mind that really kind of undermine you when you're trying to plan something and get, have all of your backups ready. I could certainly understand that, but you would be giving it your best shot. And since law schools don't average multiple scores and only take the highest, there's not much downside from an admissions perspective. It's only the time that you're putting in. But if you're seeing that you're making progress consistently over time and your practice test scores are increasing, that's certainly a good indication. It's promising. Gotcha. Okay. I think you've answered everything that I really have at the moment. My, awesome. It's most like broader stuff. It's not necessarily specific, uh, but it is an intimidating undertaking. And I do applaud you for being a professional in this field <laughs> because it's just a beast. It is, but I'm glad to help. And I'm glad to see that you're really giving it your all and asking all the right questions. Before we sign off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Um, I definitely think that the first thing that we talked about, about the scheduling and about how best to spend my time, even if it's not direct solving of problems or providing answers within sections, that anything research-wise or anything that fills that I can do that is constructive for the LSAT and not necessarily practice questions is still progress. And I don't think that I necessarily thought about that. I thought that it would almost be slacking off and something to do with that. But I do think that I'm going to take that in mind and really kind of give myself a mental break from trying to do things in the evening and instead try to focus my energy more efficiently on something that I actually can accomplish within that time and not feel bad that I don't accomplish or don't finish. Because again, this is 
a marathon and not a sprint. Certainly, certainly. Well, please keep in touch and let me know if I can help in any way moving forward. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.